like to invite you to stand and join us in singing our praises to the Lord.
So just let you know, again, still BBS season, yay. Um, we're still prepping, like, everything is going to happen, and God is going to help us get everything worked out. Um, so we have prayer reminders in the back in a little bowl. If we run out, we have more, so that's awesome. Um, and then John's going to be um, passing out. We already have one in your bulletin, but if you want more to give out to your neighborhood uh, or your community, your friends, your family, um, we have uh, advertisements for our BBS. And um, please just be praying for us as we uh, get ready for BBS in Ottawa because there's so many unanswered questions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, John is also looking for puppets for two, three um, for some of the lessons. So if you can make hand puppets, puppets, hand puppets, yes. Yeah. If you can make hand puppets or know of somewhere that has them, we can use that. Um, and for getting cookies. Oh, uh, volunteers for cookie tables and for giving cookies. We can always use that. Um, and we're still collecting stuffed animals for the kids in Madawa at this point. If we don't use them this year, we'll have them for next year. Um, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Please give us the dates. Oh, uh, July 13th through the 17th for here. And then July 25th through August 1st in Madawa. Thank you. Um, so one other thing that I that we should have done earlier that, that would be really helpful is if we could get some chairs for overflow for downstairs um, to make sure that we also have more people come in we still have space. Um, and then for sitting in the pews, the X, the X's are just positions for households to be in. Um, and that's the best way that I could find. Um, of making sure that we're maintaining six feet of distancing. Um, any more than that, and we end up being closer than six feet apart. Um, also, today, uh, also things just to be aware of. So today, we are having our Anxious Image Prayer Walk at 2 p.m. We will come together and meet at this church. We will pray for about 30 minutes together, and then we will walk over to City Hall um, and pray along the way and pray once we get there. I do know that Mayor Alvin will be there, um, and we'll have an opportunity also to pray for him and any um, other officials who are kind of making these policy decisions um, to pray that God guides them in wisdom and discernment. Um, and then we will come back. And so I want to make sure that you all know that you're more than welcome to come to that. And it's going to be a good time where you're going to hear from a variety of different leaders. Um, and we're going to just pray for our city and for our nation. And pray that we are a, a nation and a place that is racially just. Also, other points of connection. So as, you, as we talked about, one of our goals as a body is to be a body of believers that are regularly gathering with one another. And so I want to make sure that we're aware of kind of the opportunities to do that. And so every second and fourth Thursday at 7 p.m. we have our women's Bible study. They met this last Thursday. Also every Tuesday at 7 p.m. we have our online community meetings. And you'll be able to find information and get into that on the virtual bulletin. And every Wednesday at I think 1 p.m. Um, we have the women's Bible study that's led by Adriana. Is that right? Adriana? Yeah. Perfect. Um, and so those are all opportunities to gather together, and then we can, and if there are, if none of those work for you and you still want to be able to gather, let me know and we can figure out a, another time for that. Any other announcements that I have missed? So let's let's pray with one another. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for bringing us here. I thank you for continuing to preserve and keep us, Lord. I pray that as we gather together, that there is a kind of protection around us, um, that none of us become ill. Lord, I also pray that as we're gathering together in really unfamiliar circumstances, and sitting where we're not used to sitting, and wearing masks when we're not used to wearing masks in this space, um, and we're not able to to come as close as we're used to, and as close as we're as close as we love to do, Lord. Um, I pray that even still, that our focus will be on you, Lord, that we will continue to bring 
glory in your name and lift you up, Lord. Um, so I thank you just for the opportunity to do that, Lord. I thank you that this is a time of worship, Lord. Um, we pray for those gathering points that we have going forward, whether that's looking at our Bible studies or our community meetings or this prayer walk that is coming up, Lord. Um, I pray once again that you are in this glorified Lord. We lift up BDS as they're going through the planning process and the figuring out of, of how exactly everything is going to work and um, the, the emotional and spiritual preparation as well. Um, you pointing out what, it, what, what is needed in this time. I thank you that you are forward in all of these discussions and all of this process. In your name we pray. That I want to invite you to stand up as we continue to first time.
Aaron used the term hedge of protection earlier. And if you don't know what, what that's from, it, it can sound like kind of a, a weird phrase, but it, it, it relates to shepherding. Put a hedge around your sheep pasture. Um, and The 23rd Psalm, very famous, talks about how the Lord is our shepherd. He's the one who watches over us and takes care of us. And Jesus also called himself a good shepherd. He said that the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And that's what he did for us. So, Lord, we thank you for your love for us, that you would lay down your life for our sake. You are our good shepherd, and you are the lamb that was slain. And as such, you are worthy of all of our praise. In your name we pray, amen.
So one of the things that we haven't had an opportunity to do recently that is just kind of one of the things that we do regularly for a reason, which is um, share how we've seen God's love for us, how we've seen Christ's love for us manifest in our lives. And one of the reasons why we do that is because it's important to reflect on how God is showing up, on what God is doing in our present world, because it can get easy, or it can become easy to focus so much on, on negatives or on what's not happening that we miss what it is. And that's part of the reason why we gather together as a body. So even where I might be in consistent prayer over a thing, and it's been a year, it's good to hear how God is answering for other people um, as a reminder that he is a God who is faithful. He is a God who answers. And so that's what I want to do right now. I want us to spend some time considering how has God shown his love for you and for his children, how have others that you've been in contact demonstrated who God is to you? How have people in the body of Christ been a neighbor to you? One of our goals as a church is to be neighbors, both with those who are within us and those who are outside. So it's important to, to do that reflection. And so the reason why I ask about a microphone is um, the safest way to do this probably isn't to just stand up and shout. Um, <laughs> And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this microphone here as soon as I turn it off. Um, and I'm going to invite people to come, or I'm going to invite you as you feel led, as you feel called, as something kind of jogs in your memory. I'm going to invite you to come up and share. And then once we get a lull and people have shared, then I'm going to close this in prayer. Um, so I'm just going to invite people to, to come up and speak and share how, how God has shown himself, um, or how you've seen God in others, how you've seen Christ's love in others during this time period. Can we make sure that microphone is on? Because we're not getting it. Yeah. 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 
Hello. Yeah. So it's on.
my vision of the body of Christ has just exploded. And I'm amazed that day after day, week after week, now month after month after month, there is a surprising, for me surprising, sense of connection with these brothers and sisters that I probably will never see many of them because I haven't. But God's body and the body of Christ international is so beautiful. And so that has been, in spite of being stuck at home, a blessing I couldn't have experienced if I wasn't stuck at home. So I'm thankful for that. And I want to share with you this description that I also want to share. This is Romans 15, verses 5 and 6. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus. So that with one heart and mouth, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. <coughs> And that's what we've been able to do with one heart and one mind, one voice, who are our God. So it's been kind of interesting um, when COVID-19 broke out and the schools were closed, I have no idea if we have any way to continue feeding our kids. Um, I had to have an online auction, had no idea if it would yield what we needed. I was looking at dwindling funds and uh, limited ways of fundraising, and then the Lord just blew open all of these avenues that had been closed to me before. And I have still waters is, is fully funded the end to the fall, plus we're starting a summer program and there's more on the way and I'm just looking at the abundance and it's because of COVID-19. Uh, and it's putting us, stepping us into a whole new, a place we wanted to step into, but we did not have the funds to do it. And what also is happening is it's really highlighted the need that the issue of hunger, even more so, and it's what we've been doing all along, right? But now people are taking notes. Oh, they're doing that too. But one of the really coolest things that's happened because of the extra funding is we've been able to do the summer lunch program, which we started this week. This week, we were the only ones in the city providing lunches for the kids. And not only were they lunches, they were prepared every morning by a chef, delivered in restaurant trays, hot and magnificent. And the kids got great food. So I'm just thanking the Lord for opening up avenues that really have been blocked us before. Because every going into every summer, I said, we really want to do a lunch program, but we just don't have the funding. And all the other lunch programs, we're going to hand the kids bang lunch, right? Ours is hot, <laughs> prepared by a chef. We are cutting edge. And there's a really good chance, right now we're at one side, there's a really good chance that funding will come through that we will be able to open. Second site. So keep us in prayer and we need volunteers. But this is Monday through Friday. We need people to help us serve. So if you're interested in doing that, that's great. I know some of the youth and the youth group are doing it. But um, where other people, their provision has shriveled, our provision has brought in, in the midst of all of this. And I'm just saying, okay, God, you know what you're doing because it doesn't depend on the situation for you. When you want something to be done, you open the windows of heaven. So I'm just thanking the Lord for that. So, Lord, we do lift our lives up to you, Lord. 
Lord, we continue to mourn and grieve with those for whom this is not uh, a time of abundance. Um, we mourn and grieve for those who have lost loved ones, um, those who are sick right now, too. And where there is something that you're asking us to do, Lord, we ask that that is clear to us. But we also praise you for the growth that we have seen, for the abundance, for the connections, for the pressing into you that we've been able to see, Lord. We thank you for how your love has been more apparent to some of us. We thank you for the encouragement that you've granted us, for the endurance that you've given us, Lord. I thank you that we've been able to see your love worked out in all of these different ways, Lord. We praise you. We are blessed to be in a place where we can globally talk about what you've done where we can realize how you continue to be at work in the world, even in the midst of hardship and pain. We ask that our eyes are continually open to what you have done well, to what you have made good, to what you have redeemed, even when it seems irredeemable. We thank you for being here with us right now, for granting us the ability to be together, Lord. And I thank you for all of the people who worked so hard to make that happen. We pray for a continued blessing on them as well. We pray that we continue to have ears to hear your voice as you ask us to do things, that we have eyes to see as you see, that our hearts are broken as your heart is broken. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And with that, I want to invite you to stand as we sing a song of worship and then the gospel. Thank you. 
to that question is that it is missing report at a, at a very serious direct level. Um, and I, I do understand some of the reasons why he made that. And we can have that discussion if you want. Um, but I was also listening to a sermon by Billy Graham um, the same day that I was looking at the story. And he made a, a really valid and a really true point. Which is to say that when Jesus came, God had command over, God still continues to have command over all the universe. He, he could decide when Jesus was going to come on this earth. Jesus could have come right now when we all have a camera in our pocket. We would have ID picture of Jesus. We would all have crystal clear certainty in terms of what he looked like. But even if we, even if Jesus was supposed to be born in 4 BC to 0 AD. That's fine. We can look at contemporaries of that time. So we have a, a picture, just a second, of Kujula Kephesis, which is a prince in India. Or for closer to where Jesus is, a uh, uh, near contemporary of Jesus, Cicero came before Jesus, um, widely considered one of the greatest public speakers speakers in all of history, and we, we're pretty confident that's what he looked like. Pompey, Julius Caesar, a little bit before Jesus, and we are pretty confident that that's roughly what they looked like. Maybe maybe the sculptor took a little bit of, of license, maybe someone had a mold on there that they didn't want to sculpt, but pretty much, that's what they looked like. If God felt that it were deeply important for us to have a, a strong idea of what Jesus physically looked like. That was entirely within the realm of possibility even when Jesus was born. And so it should be striking to us. It should cause us to, to wonder a little bit that probably the best physical description of Jesus is in Isaiah 53, where we talk about how he's not much to look at. And this is Isaiah speaking Six, seven hundred years before Jesus is born. That's the, what Jesus looked like fundamentally isn't the point. The point is who he was, which is what this Luke passage is seeking to answer. So the disciples answer Jesus. Jesus is asked, What do the crowd say about me? And the disciples answer in verse 19. They answered, John the Baptist, but others, Elijah, and still others that one of the ancient prophets has arisen. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered, the Messiah of God. So Peter here makes an enormous claim that we have to unpack. As you probably know, uh, when we had the privilege of hiring Haley as our youth director intern, we started going through an educational series um, with me and a number of other women in the church, including Haley. And one of the things that they talked about that is something that's always been important to me is the idea of narrative and the whole story of the Bible. And there's a lot of different ways that you can break it up depending on who you are. But one thing that we also know in looking at story, and you probably remember this from English class, is that there's kind of a map of how basically all good stories work, right? So you have an introduction, um, you, you introduce a problem, you have a rising action that, that ratchets up the problem, a climax that, that is the direct confrontation between our protagonist and the problem, falling action, which kind of deals with the effects of the climax, and then a resolution. Everything is fundamentally good. And most stories can kind of be mapped onto this model. And God is really clever because he has lots of B plots and lots of C plots and on and on and on. But if we're looking at the overarching kind of plot of the Bible, here's what we get. We get an introduction which is God created the world and it was good. And then a problem is introduced which is that the serpent comes and, and deceives Eve, and Eve and Adam both decide to, to follow their own wishes, their own will, and, and 
do what is right in their eyes rather than what is right in the eyes of the Lord. Humanity sins and humanity falls. And even as that problem is introduced, God also gives Adam and Eve a promise. He says that out of your seed there's going to come a man, and that this man, he's going to crush the head of the serpent, but even as he crushes the head of the serpent, that serpent will strike his heel. And so we get the promise of the snake crusher. And as you read through the Old Testament, what you'll see is a continual refinement of that promise. And so we come to like Genesis chapter 12, and God comes to Abraham and says that all of the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through you. And we go, okay, like we're, we're connecting the dots. Snake crusher is probably coming through Abraham. We move on a little bit more, Genesis chapter 49, and we see that Judah is going to, the scepter is never going to depart from him. And we go, okay, the, we're, we're now talking about an eternal kingdom that's connected here. Maybe it's going to go from through Abraham, through Judah, onto forward. We continue looking at the line of Judah, we come to David, and God, God reiterates this, that there's going to be a, a kingdom that's going to last forever, and furthermore, that this descendant of David, this descendant of Judah, that he will in fact be a son to God. And then in Isaiah 53, we find out that not only will this be a, a good and glorious kingdom, but we also learn about the suffering, that he's going to be a righteous servant who is crushed and suffers for our sake. And all of that climaxes in the life of death and resurrection of Jesus. Because this whole time, for these last 2,000 years, we've been looking for a particular person. We've been looking for, really, the snake crusher. And that is Jesus. This, this claim that he is the Messiah is an acknowledgement that this person that we've been searching for since the beginning of Genesis is, in fact, here right now. That's our climax. And then as we continue on in that story, we hit the falling action. That's what most of the New Testament is. is how do we live in light of the fact that sin and death have been defeated? How do we live in light of the fact that Messiah has come and has offered forgiveness of sins to all of us? And that's what the, the letters are doing. That's what the book of Acts is doing. And that's actually where we are in the story right now. We're still in the falling action with the promise of the resolutions of the story, which is that ultimately Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire, and ultimately we will enter into new creation and new earth, where everything once again is good. But here Peter is, is locating Jesus in that story, and he's claiming that Jesus is the culminating person who's been prophesied throughout history. It's relevant to note he is probably not claiming that Jesus is God himself. Um, just given some of the things he says later, it doesn't look like he understood that at this point. But still, a huge claim for Peter to make. Verse 21. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed, and on the third day, be raised to life. So here we've made this huge claim, right? Like, we've been looking for this person, and I put Peter, I believe that you're it. And Jesus says, don't, don't tell anyone else about that. Which is kind of an affirmation that he's right. But then he flips it and makes sure that Peter and the disciples understand, make sure that we understand the need for suffering in this space. Recognize that I must suffer many things and be rejected. That I, in fact, am going to die. That's part of the Messiah. Verse 23, Then he said to them all, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. So Jesus has, we've had this discussion about who he is, and then we move to a discussion about what we do with that. 
it says that the, the call is to follow me, and here's what it looks like. It looks like denying yourself. It's not a prerequisite to following him. That is the walk itself, is denying yourself. The path of following Jesus begins with taking up the troubles that are earned in following Jesus, living sacrificially for the kingdom, and carrying out the life that he describes and leads. That's just the baseline expectation for what it looks like. And he continues to iterate on that in verse 24. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. So there's a, when we talk about the kingdom of God all the time, a uh, language that we use is the upside down kingdom. Because normally you would think that in order to save our lives, we should be safe people. We should work to, to preserve ourselves. And Jesus says that actually it's the opposite. He shares a profound truth here. That there are any number of reasons that you might have to protect yourself. Any number of reasons why you might say, you know, God, I don't want to do that thing. And that ultimately, what that's doing is that's placing something else as your ultimate. And that that system will break down. Anything that you will allow to be ultimate to you will lead to your ruin. If your family becomes everything to you and you just pour yourself and all of your life into your family, what you're ultimately doing is asking them to carry burdens that they are not built for. And when they crack under those burdens, they've not just wrecked that, but they've wrecked everything that you poured your life into. If safety becomes everything to you, you know, I just want to live as long as possible. At the farthest reaches of that, you just become a coward. You're unable to take risks or do anything because I need to be safe. If nation becomes everything to you, and you will live in frustration as the place that you live doesn't live up to the ideal that they hold, which has been true of every nation on earth. If comfort is everything to you, you're going to be like the Israelites in the wilderness who are marching through the wilderness and asking, can we go back to Egypt? Can we go back to slavery? Because that was more comfortable for me there. Anything that you allow to be your ultimate will ultimately lead to your ruin other than God. He furthers this. What does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves? And we, I think we know this. We know that all of the things that our world tells us to chase ultimately don't lead to final satisfaction. We know people who are who've chased wealth and succeeded. They got it. And they're miserable. Who chase fame and respect. And they're at the top of their field. Everyone respects them. Everyone acknowledges the great job that they've done. And that's not enough. And they continue to hunger for more. People who pour themselves and their lives into their families. And their families take advantage of them, leave them disillusioned and confused about what's happened. People who pour themselves into their career or into their spouse will be dropped at the first opportunity. No amount of pouring into something that is not God ultimately leads to fulfillment. Ultimately leads to joy, because it's asking it to carry a burden that it's not built for. And that's not to say that family is bad. 
That's not to say that respect is that. But that we can't ask it to carry a burden that it's not built for. To fill a hole in us that is only able to be filled by God. Verse 26. Those who are ashamed of me and of my words, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. So we've been talking about what your ultimate is, where your priorities are. And he makes a bold statement, which is that if you allow anything else to inform you to such a degree that you are unable to speak for Jesus, to such a degree that you become ashamed of him, then when he comes into his glory and the glory of the Father, and it's important that those two are linked, when he comes into that, that he too will be ashamed of you. And then he gives a verse that's, that has dispute in it. Um, he says that there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. And there is a lot of discussion that you can go into about exactly what he means by the kingdom of God in that statement. Does he mean the resurrection, or Pentecost, or the transfiguration that's about to happen, or the second coming, or, or new creation? And it's worthwhile to follow what Jesus' argument has been, which is, Jesus asks, who, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Messiah. And Jesus goes, okay, so I'm the Messiah. However, it's important to recognize that the Messiah must go through suffering. And that in fact, in order to follow him, your allegiance to the Messiah, your allegiance to Jesus, must be great enough that you are able to deny yourself on his behalf. And that's not solely for the far off promise of forgiveness, but it's also for the real and present kingdom that you will experience now, that you are experiencing now. One of the things that we do as we share how we've seen God work and move is we're sharing how we have experienced the kingdom of God in this present time on this present earth. And then we get to see all of this in action. Not just in word, but in deed. We turn to verse 28. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were way down to sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed him. And they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen in. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. So here Luke records a week and a day, eight days, and we just kind of glide over that time. And that's significant because now we're talking about a time of new beginnings. In the Israelite imagination, there are some important numbers, most notably 3, 7, 8, and 12. 3 um, is just kind of a stable number, 7 being the number of completion, 12 the like, 12 tribes of Israel, and 8 being one more than complete, or a new beginning. And it's weird that we don't have, like, in the English, 
In English, 11 should be that number for us, because 10 is generally our whole rounded number, but it's not, so. <laughs> but that's, that's what it is for them. And it's relevant that this is a time of new beginnings, because this is generally seen as kind of the, the turning point of the book of Luke. So much so that my, like, the most exhaustive commentary that I've been reading is the Baker's exegetical commentary. And it actually moves on to the second volume at the end of chapter 9. But throughout this whole time, people have been asking, who is, who is this Jesus? What do we do with him? And we got a verbal answer here. But now here on the mountain, we get a physical answer. This, this is your answer, that he is the Son of God, the Chosen One of God. And he is, in fact, the ultimate expression of God. If you want to see the Father, you look at the Son. And God makes tremendous claims here. See, Moses and Elijah are here with Jesus at this time. And as they're here with Jesus, that should have us thinking about Moses and Elijah, and also thinking about times that they've been on mountains. So Elijah, most famously, is on Mount Carmel, um, where everyone wants to worship Baal, and he and God has the fire come down and, and burn up the altar, which is this powerful display of God's might and power, which is what God's doing here. The parallels are a little bit closer when we look at what God did with Moses on Mount. In Exodus chapter 19, which is when Moses is forming, when, when Moses and God are kind of forming the covenant, in Exodus chapter 19, verse 9, we see, Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud, in order that the people may hear when I speak with you, and so trust you ever after. So as God is speaking to Moses, he says, I am going to come in a cloud, in order that you might be listened to. And how interesting is it that here in chapter 9, we see a cloud appear before the disciples. And what is the command of God? That Jesus is the Son of God, that he's chosen, and to listen to him. And in claiming him as the Son of God, we also activate that promise that God made to David, that your offspring will have the kingdom, and that he will be a son to me. In Exodus chapter 33, verses 22-22, Moses has been talking with God, asking that God continue to preserve the people of Israel. God eventually agrees, and Moses asks to see God's glory. And here's God's answer. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, see, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I am passed by. So Moses wants to see God's glory, and he's told you can't. Because to see my glory is for you to die. And this is why it was important that earlier Jesus had connected his glory with the glory of the Father. Because here, on the mountain, we see God's glory shining forth. But the disciples now are able to see it through the sun. They're able to see it directly. And then my last one, in Exodus chapter 34, verse 29, after Moses has spoken with God, we see Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. So Moses and Jesus both pray with God at this mountain. And Moses is so saturated in God's presence 
that his skin begins reflecting God's light, like a moon. Jesus, though, Jesus is actually shining out of himself. There's no reflection that's happening here. His face changes of its own accord because the light that is shining from him is the light of God itself. This is, once again, a claim that Jesus is God, happening in action rather than in direct speech. And as we close, it is worth considering and spending time with the idea that as Jesus' glory is visible to these disciples, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah are talking about what he is about to do in Jerusalem. The time that Jesus' glory is most visible, that the glory of God is in fact most visible and most able to be seen, is when they are talking about Jesus' death, about how he is going to be persecuted, how he's going to suffer, how he's going to die, and as Jesus says, how he's going to rise again. If we seek to know who Jesus is, if we seek to know what he looks like, the portrait that we're asked to consider, the portrait that we're invited to think deeply on, to meditate on, is of him at the cross. of the one who had been promised through all of history, the one who was prophesied to defeat sin and death, who was perfectly righteous, who was entirely without sin, suffering and dying in order to take on the sin of the world, and that ultimately, he is victorious as he rises again. And that through him rising again, we are invited into freedom. We are invited into victory. And so I want to give us just a few moments to think on that before I close my prayer. Before I close in prayer. So let's just take some moments to pray to God as we consider the death of his sacrifice and how his glory is made visible there.
We have not been good at denying ourselves. And that you give us the strength to do that. That we do not allow anything to take the position that we are built to hold in our hearts. But that we focus on you. That we glorify you. For you are worthy of all of the honor and of all of the are majestic Lord. I pray that that sinks deeply into us as we go about our day. In your name we pray. Amen. With that, I want to invite you to stand as we continue to praise our Lord.